Well, if I could uh, get everyone's attention, we'll go ahead and get started this morning. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all here. Thank you for being with us. Uh, my name is Alan Schaefer. I serve as Executive Director of the Diesel Technology Forum, and welcome to our press conference here at the National Press Club. Uh, today, uh, we're going to have a few introductory remarks and uh, then get right into the meat of our study uh, with the presentation of findings by Dr. Richard McCann from Aspen Environmental Group. We'll be happy to entertain your questions, and then we have uh, a lunch provided for those that are here with us today. I'd first like to recognize the members of the Diesel Technology Forum, which make this kind of research possible, and we have a good representation of those with us here in the room today and without which your uh, support, leadership in technology and, uh, and forward thinking would not, uh, without this, we'd not be, it would not be possible. So thank you very much to all of our Diesel Technology Forum members with us today. Uh, our study today has been conducted by uh, a, a joint effort involving Aspen Environmental Group and Dr. Richard McCann, who you're going to hear from momentarily, and their background and his background are here on this slide and also in partnership with M-Cubed, a policy and consulting firm also from Sacramento. Two California-based firms uh, helped us complete this, uh, this research. Uh, so uh, with that, let me uh, offer a few introductory remarks, if I might. Um, and I want to, again, say thank you for joining us here at the National Press Club, those in the room and those watching online. We are streaming this press conference live on the Internet, so we thank all of you that are with us there. Um, today we have uh, some exciting new information about our nation's economy, jobs, exports, and energy-efficient technologies to release to you. A great deal has been said in recent days about green jobs and green economies, the role of government, the role of the private sector, what is working, what's not working, which technologies are aspirations of the future, which technologies are here delivering benefits today. And today we are pleased to share new findings about the economic impact and importance of a technology and an industry that are working, that are the driving force behind our economy today and without question will be a driving force behind our economy tomorrow. We're talking, of course, about diesel power, a technology that still stands today as unmatched in its unique capabilities of doing work, a technology that has evolved from its invention utilizing biofuels over 100 years ago to the predominant technology of choice powering the fundamental sectors of our global economy. There is no better example than diesel as a technology and an industry that is homegrown, highly successful, that provides good paying jobs, and is an economic engine of progress. It is an industry built on the hard work of research, innovation, and continuous improvement. And it just so happens that diesel technology is the kind of energy efficient, low emissions product that is highly demand around the globe today. As our study will reveal, diesel is both a driver and a product of economic growth. Its impact and benefits are felt across a wide swath of the global economy. Diesel is also one of our nation's greatest environmental success stories, having undergone a fundamental transformation to cleaner fuels, near zero emissions, and greater efficiency. These changes are what propel diesel forward as a technology of the future. Consider that two recent national policy initiatives anticipate the greater use and further improvements in diesel. The national fuel economy standards for cars and light duty trucks beginning in 2017, are expected to be met by an increasing number of uh, light-duty vehicles and passenger cars in the market for consumers. On the heavy-duty side, the first-ever fuel efficiency standards for medium and heavy-duty commercial trucks and buses that take effect in 2014 will drive further innovation and efficiency gains in diesel as a key compliance strategy. Likewise, investing in our nation's core infrastructure will demand a greater use of diesel power in construction machines and equipment, whether that's building bike paths or bridges, tunnels or train stations, or to bring more high-speed internet to more communities, installing wind farms or upgrading the nation's electric grid, all of these activities demand the greater use of diesel power. But today our nation's challenges are significant and they are urgent. We are in a time when confidence for doing the right thing is in high demand but short supply particularly as it applies to our approach on national energy policy. Of course, it is in our national interest to explore and diversify our, fuel, our pool of fuels and energy technologies for the future. But it is also in our national interest to recognize the further capabilities and leverage technologies like clean diesel power that are proven, available, and affordable and are getting the job done today, not maybe in 10 or 15 years ago from now, but right now. 
When we talk about putting Americans back to work with high value jobs, building things that make us better and enable us to do more, when we talk about harnessing America's knowledge, innovation, and engineering to make our nation more energy efficient and our industries more competitive in the global marketplace, when we look for technologies and products that will help grow our economy to the next level, when we seek out technologies that use energy more efficiently and diversify the fuels they use, when we focus on what can get the job done right now and technologies that are not merely aspirations of the future, but those that are getting it done today, we see all the reasons why this new generation of clean diesel technology is vital to our future economic prosperity and energy security. From earth moving to e-commerce and everything in between, we are talking about the importance of diesel technology to the U.S. economy. I'd like to now introduce the principal author of our study today, Dr. Richard McCann of Aspen Environmental Group, who's here from Sacramento, California. Thank you, Alan, and uh, thank you to the Diesel Technology Forum for sponsoring this study. Um, I'm going to uh, go through uh, discussing the findings of our report um, and the key, the key summary points that, uh, that we found that were com particularly compelling from this study. Um, but I want to begin first by discussing the advantages that diesel, the package of diesel has as a, as a technology for delivering the services that it does. Um, its diesel is particularly energy efficient in comparison to other technologies. Um, it has a particular ability to deliver a, a substantial amount of power for it, the applications in, with it, in which it is used. Um, it ha is durable and it's uh, highly reliable. Um, it is particularly portable in comparison to many of the other technologies that are alternatives. It has uh, particular fuel handling characteristics that, it, that give it relative safety and ease of use. Um, and it's flexible in terms of the types of fuels that it can use. Um, the highlights of the findings of our report um, uh, are uh, uh, particularly interesting. Um, one of the things in looking at this is that we find that diesel technology is ubiquitous in the in the nation's economy. It powers all sectors of the economy, particularly those that are fundamental to the function of the economy. Um, diesel technology, the diesel technology super sector is about the same size as that for all utilities, that is energy, water, uh, telecommunications. Um, when you add in the diesel reliant sectors, which I'll discuss uh, as we move on, um, it produces as much national income as the, as the uh, information sector, that is, is the internet and uh, software development. Um, and the diesel industries themselves uh, generate a substantial economic value for the country. The jobs pay well above the national average, and they produce a disproportionate share of U.S. exports. Um, other, uh, other highlights of the report is that diesel is particularly important to specific sectors. 90% um, of agricultural's uh, $1.2 trillion in shipments are, are shipped using diesel-powered uh, vehicles. 98% of construction and mining fuel use is in, uh, in diesel-powered vehicles and equipment. 85% of transit vehicles and 49% of transit, transit passenger miles are diesel-powered. And 83% of Army and Marine vehicles and equipment are diesel-powered. Um, and the public sector is particularly reliant on diesel as well. Um, virtually all emergency vehicles, such as ambulances, fire engines, and tow trucks are diesel powered. Um, critical service sectors, such as hospitals, data centers, air traffic control centers, pipelines, use diesel for emergency standby power. And it's also for remote power, the, almost the sole power source. Um, the national defense relies on diesel to move materials, munitions, weapons, personnel between both theaters and on the battlefield. And non-transit, non-rail transit is particularly dependent on diesel, both for uh, land and sea transit. I'm going to move on to talking the, about the uh, scope and methodology that we use for this report. Um, first off, it's an assessment of the economic value delivered by diesel technology to the U.S. economy. It's a state-of-the-world report as it stands today. 
Uh, it also, we are focusing on the diesel, what we call the diesel technology super sector, which is technology production, fuel production, and services, deliver services delivery for diesel. And we also looked at what are the diesel reliant uh, industries that are in resource extraction, agriculture, construction, and freight hauling. The methodology that we used is a regional impact assessment approach. Uh, we used the implan model. There's a recent study by University of California that validated the use of implan in this type of uh, assessment. Um, and uh, what we did is we identified the relationships of diesel technology and fuel industries to key economic sectors. We also assessed the share of US GDP and employment produced when, when using diesel. That is, is, what is the technology enabled economic activity that, uh, that was created by using diesel. So the diesel industries that we looked at, the ones that are covered that we, within the diesel technology super sector are um, diesel fuel production, which is both oil production and refining. Um, we also looked at diesel technology manufacturing, which includes auto and truck manufacturing, rail equipment manufacturing, ships, uh, off-road equipment and industrial equipment such as tractors and military equipment manufacturing. And then we also included diesel, the diesel servicing sector. Then we also looked at the diesel reliant industries. These are industries that basically would have difficulty producing their goods if they weren't reliant on diesel. And these include uh, sectors such as agriculture, mining, oil and gas production, construction, trade and freight hauling, um, utilities, passenger, transport and government services. So I want to begin first by, des by describing the diesel technology super sector and some of the findings that we have by looking in particular at that sector. Um, I want diesel facilitates a large share of the US GDP. Uh, the diesel technology uh, fuels and services sector together produce about the same amount of GDP output as the utility sector, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and then when you add in the diesel reliant sectors, about 4.5% of the US GDP is produced um, with the, using the diesel technology. When looking at the diesel technology super sector itself, uh, we can see that it produces about $275 billion towards the US GDP. Um, about half of this is from the fuels production sector and about half from the technology production sector. Um, this sector also uh, employs about a half million people. Um, construction, the uh, off-road equipment manufacturing, which is construction, mining, and agricultural equipment, is the largest component of this particular sector. <coughs> um, and our finding in this is that the diesel technology and fuels sector has very high productivity. Um, it facilitates about $4.51 of value added to the US uh, GDP for every dollar of value added from the diesel technology sector. That is, is that for every dollar of output from the diesel technology sector, there is $4.51 basically enabled in the US GDP. There's a, a 4.5 multiplier of technology influence from this sector. Um, this sector also, uh, created $207,000 in national income for each employee, which is about twice the national average of about $110,000. And the average weekly wages in this sector reflect that productivity. It's about, the wages are about 60% higher than the national average, um, averaging about $1,400 per week in this, in this technology super sector. When we look at the diesel services sector, it employs another three quarters of a million people. Thank you. Um, this sector uh, supports development operations and maintenance of diesel vehicles and equipment, um, but it's also often embedded in uh, other sectors. So in some ways, we're undercounting the influence of diesel services uh, in, our, in our study. Um, it added $82 billion directly and $207 billion after accounting for multipliers to the U.S. economy. Um, and as I mentioned, it employs about 764,000 uh, individuals. Um, diesel also is a prime U.S. export. Uh, 
about 9% of the output from this sector is exported, which is a ratio or, or proportion that's five times higher than the national average for the manufacturing industries. And, and it's 4.4% of all U.S. exports. And I want to turn to the diesel-reliant industries. These are the ones that really, uh, diesel is at the core of their particular functions. So for example, agriculture relies heavily on both tractors in the field and uh, trucks to get their products to market. And when we look at this sector, it creates another $455 billion in GDP. That's diesel's share of, of the output from these particular sectors. And manufacturing is the largest uh, particular share of, the, of this uh, component or this uh, agglomeration of various sectors. Um, and when we dig down into each one of these individual sectors, we find some very interesting results. 83% um, of all the freight value that is shipped in the United States is shipped using diesel-powered uh, vehicles, ships, trucks, uh, rail, railroads, um, barges, et cetera. And you can see how that has grown over the uh, time from 1997 to 2007. Um, diesel's share of highway fuel use has grown 50% since 1980. That is, is that diesel, has, diesel use has become a bigger component of the fuel use on, uh, on U.S. highways uh, over the last 30 years. And you can see in part why this is happening, um, that diesel fuel use and U.S. GDP growth are highly correlated. The lines almost lie over each other uh, when comparing the U.S. GDP and um, diesel use on, on highway use over the last 30 years. Um, and then when we look at non-highway diesel-powered freight modes, those have also uh, increased dramatically over that same time period. Um, locomotive efficiency has doubled uh, over the last 30 years from 235 ton miles to 480 ton miles. Um, and rail ton miles, that is a measure of how much uh, freight is moved uh, per mile, has more than doubled since 1981 to 2008. So essentially what's happened in, with the rail industry is that it's moving twice as much freight with the same amount of fuel over the last 30 years. And then in addition, international trade by ship has also uh, doubled essentially over the last 30 years. Uh, again, ship, most shipping is, relies on diesel-powered engines. Um, when you look at the off-road component, that is, is the resource extraction industries and the agricultural industries, um, you can see that um, diesel is the dominant fuel. And in fact, in many cases, over 90% of the fuel use in any one particular sector is for diesel equipment. Um, you can see that agriculture is 90, over 98 percent. Construction, again, is also over 98 percent. Um, and so this is the story throughout all of these sectors. So what's the future of diesel? Um, diesel basically, as Alan mentioned, it fits into the environmental goals that, uh, that the nation faces. That diesel is 20 to 40 percent more efficient than spark ignition technologies. Um, and the, this is reflected in when you look at the European auto market, where 50% of the European auto market is diesel-fueled automobiles. Um, and the fuel economy standards that the, that the government has been um, setting favor the introduction and use of diesel technologies in these particular markets. Federal and state policies have led to clean diesel technologies. Again, as uh, Alan mentioned, that the uh, emissions have dropped 99% from diesel technologies. And so diesel is also able to use a range of fuels, biofuels being one of those, uh, more readily than some of the other technologies. So in order, in moving, looking at how we enable diesel technology, one of, one of the interesting findings is that, is that U.S. energy R&D has a very high benefit cost ratio. Uh, according to the DOE, it's got a 60 to 1 benefit cost ratio. And when we're looking at how we introduce uh, clean diesel into the U.S. economy, we, we find that the diesel retrofit programs have a 13 to 1 benefit cost ratio, so that you're getting $13 in various societal and private benefits for every dollar spent on these programs. So just to summarize uh, our findings, that 
there's a strong economic influence and strong job creation from these sectors. Looking at the diesel industry itself, uh, the technologies and fuels industries in particular, um, we find that there's $183 billion uh, and 1.25 million jobs created directly from these sectors. And accounting for the multiplier effect through the rest of the economy, we have almost half a trillion dollars in economic activity that's created just by the industry sector itself. And then when you move on looking at the re other reliant industries, you find that many of these industries, you have an influence factor in the wholesale trade sector, which is about 7%, and it goes all the way up to 35% for agriculture. 35% uh, of agro agricultural output is dependent on diesel. When you sum the output from these various sectors, you come up with another half trillion dollars in economic output uh, to the, for the U.S. economy. So our conclusions are that diesel technology is ubiquitous throughout the U.S. economy. It's key to producing fundamental resources and goods and a prime mover of four-fifths of the freight. Um, the technologies and fuel sectors are twice as productive as the U.S. average for manufacturing industries, and its wages are three-fifths higher than those industries on average. And um, the sector exports five times more output than the national average, and about 4% of total U.S. exports come from the diesel technology sec super sector. And with that, um, I'm open for questions. We, Alan will be joining me at the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, questions for Richard relative to our study? Yes. Um, in your uh, chart here showing uh, diesel reliance sectors, uh, manufacturing, you pointed out the largest sectors. Could you say some more about what, what sectors of manufacturing are included in that? Uh, that that's, that's for all manufacturing sectors, and so it ranges uh, depending on the type of uh, manufacturing that you're doing. But it involves – a lot of it is uh, in factory uh, movement of, of goods between sectors or uh, uh, equipment that is diesel-powered within, within the uh, manufacturing plant. So, for example, cranes are a, a prime example of um, the type of diesel power that is used in, in manufacturing. Yes, it would. Yes. If you could restate the questions uh, that were given for the yep. benefit of the website. Yes. I was uh, wondering if you could uh, say a little bit more about what sorts of the federal and state policies uh, have uh, led to clean diesel technologies. Uh, and if you could also expand that to particularly talk about uh, the, role, the role of biodiesel and uh, renewable fuel standards. Right. So this is a two-part question, which is the first is how federal and state policies have affected or enabled clean diesel technologies, and then also how biodiesel is um, used in diesel. Um, so the the policies that, um, to a large extent, have been the combinations of the uh, emission standards that have enabled uh, new trucks, other equipment to uh, be um, introduced into the marketplace. So you have, uh, for example, the off-road is a Tier 1, Tier 2, two Tier 3, and about to be introduced Tier 4 emission standards. Um, the the uh, emission standards that began in 1990, uh, the 97, 2004, and 2007, and 2010 standards for trucks. Um, and so those are particular to the emission controls for those particular trucks and off-road equipment. And then there's been the low, ultra low sulfur diesel fuel, which um, is used um, not only in on highway use, but because it's a component of, uh, it's so easy, that's the dominant fuel market and that's what they're producing for. It's also used in off-road equipment as well. Um, and th the, those sorts of policies, there's also been um, a lot of retrofit programs. So for example, in California, they have the Carl Moyer program where they um, fund retrofit programs directly for diesel technologies, and that's been a very highly successful program. Um, and then there's the U.S. program that has also funded um, uh, retrofits as well, and that's uh, been very successful. Um, and then in terms of uh, uh, 
use of biodiesel. Um, the technology, one of the beauties of diesel is that it's a relatively flexible technology. There's so many stories of older diesel, the old days of diesel where people could pour in basically just about anything into a diesel engine and it would run. Um, and so, you know, maybe it would run on water. Uh, you know, uh, the, of course you have, uh, there's more um, uh, tuning of the engines now, so it doesn't have quite the same flexibility, but it does have the ability to burn um, biodiesel and other fuels uh, very readily. Um, one thing I might Ooh. add on the question relative to biofuels that there is, of course, the anticipation of a more expanded use of first and second generation renewable diesel fuels in the fuel stream um, as a result of the EPA standards, as a result of some state activity, and uh, a number of other uh, a number of other things. So, you know, we anticipate in the future that the diesel is is in some ways going to be going back to its roots a little bit with the more consistent and expanded use of these bio-based fuel compounds, and that, of course, for every um, opportunity we have to displace a gallon of petroleum diesel with biofuels that further enhances the performance and value of the diesel platform. So, um, and we find in some sectors like underground mining, for example, by using very high blends of biodiesel, they're able to um, avoid the use of some emissions control technology. Um, we see in, in some sectors uh, biofuels uh, playing, playing bigger roles. Um, we see the introduction of new clean diesel passenger cars as a place where uh, biofuels are accepted um, and we'll look for more expanded use of those vehicles and, and we would expect the biofuels as well. So um, this is, a, you know, uh, I think, an opportunity that's, that's going to bloom and, and blossom here in the, in the coming years, the use of biodiesel uh, in a bigger way with, uh, with the diesel technology. Next question. Yes. Um, the question for those on the internet is, is whether or not we feel that um, the alignment of the administration's priorities and funding for uh, energy technologies and research and development um, is proper, and given the example of, of substantial investments in electric vehicles and perhaps less investment on the diesel side. And I would have to say that uh, we would absolutely um, agree that there is a, a very high imbalance there, and I think as one of the slides just towards the end here showed that the return on investment from a dollar spent to improve diesel technology, which is so widely used for the economy, delivers far more benefits in a far nearer time frame than we might predict from some aspirational technology. So um, programs like uh, Super Truck, 21st Century Truck, that have made very modest investments, you know, on the order of, you know, less than $100 million probably that um, have reaped benefits throughout the economy of making today's heavy-duty highway trucks more energy efficient and lower emissions. Uh, small investments deliver big results when it comes to diesel, and uh, that's also true in the, in the investments that our government makes for energy R&D. And as I've said in my opening remarks, I think there's a, there's a very strong feeling that as a nation we need to explore a wide range of technologies. But, um, you know, we have great solutions and opportunities in front of us today. Some of those can be as simple as turning off the lights when you leave a room in one case. They can also be a greater use of things like clean diesel cars, which are 20 to 40 percent more fuel efficient than gasoline um, and very competitive or more fuel efficient than hybrids, a technology that's affordable in here today. So we, we would, uh, and defer to our member companies that could speak specifically um, uh, at some point in the future about, um, about specific investments in government programs, but um, that's on the energy side. I think, you know, on the retrofit side, um, we've seen a, a wonderful uh, five-year period where we've invested as a nation, um, you know, several hundred million dollars into modernizing and upgrading uh, existing diesel engines and equipment across the country. Every state and virtually every community has benefited from uh, these programs. And uh, unfortunately, even with the reauthorization that happened uh, towards the end of last year by the Congress, 
Um, the administration has proposed to uh, zero out the, uh, the DIRA, the Diesel Emissions Reduction Act uh, program um, for this budget. And that's, of course, uh, quite disappointing that uh, a program that for every dollar that you put in, we know delivers at least $13 in benefits and is often matched uh, on a very high ratio by private and other government funds further leveraging small investments. And I think, you know, where we are with our economy is that, you know, we need to be careful with our investments, invest in things that we know are going to deliver big bangs for the buck. And I think you'd be hard pressed to find a program, a technology, research investments um, that would that would compare to the way that diesel does in so many different ways. So, you know, we we of course would love to see more more support from the government and these research and development programs. The support we have is being well utilized and it's delivering real benefits today. It's not, you know, these are not science projects that reports are given 10 years from now. You know, you can look at commercial trucks today and you can point out the improvements that have been made over the last decade as a result of those investments at DOE. Yeah, um, just to follow up a little bit on that too, which is something that I think we point out in our report, the, the uh, trucking construction and agricultural industries are dominated by small firms. That is, is that with a few number of employees, they're very atomistic in the, in the industries. Those industries have a lot of difficulty accessing credit. That is, is being able to get loans in order to invest in new generation technology. Having a program like a, a retrofit program, a diesel retrofit program, basically pushes, has the ability to push them to a tipping point so that they can invest in new technologies, get move out of their older equipment, which is typically uh, meeting much uh, poorer emission standards and get them into new technologies much more effectively. And so that it's, it's a place where there's a market failure because these industries can't access credit, particularly in today's credit climate. I mean, it's changed since 2008 substantially. And it gets them over the hump into these other programs. So that's why those kinds of programs are particularly effective and why you see such a high benefit cost ratio from those programs. Other questions? Yes. I'd like to know more about the relationship in the improvements you've been talking about in diesel technology. Are those improvements mostly around the efficiency of the engine itself? Or I guess the question really is, is the future in more efficient engines, or is it really in sh sh switching to biofuels? Are, are, how, what's the relationship between those two? Um, that's an easy one. I think um, you know, over the last decade, diesel as a technology uh, in general, um, beginning in the highway world, highway vehicles, and now in the off-road sector, um, and including the passenger cars and clean diesel car segment, has undergone a, a transformation that's been driven by environmental objectives. That is, we need to produce vehicles that are very low, if not near zero emissions for nitrogen oxides and particulate. And uh, the good news is that we're there. The diesel today is uh, nothing like it was 10, 15, 20 years ago. Uh, these are very emissions competitive with gasoline, with natural gas, with other technologies. So we've spent the last decade really making diesel a clean technology. I think the future is all about um, energy efficiency. And there is an anticipation that there will be further improvements in the diesel engine, things like capturing waste heat and plumbing that back into mechanical energy, uh, things like um, making our fuels uh, more efficient and enabling us to do more work there, uh, optimizing our emissions control system so that the vehicle as a total a holistic thing can do more uh, with less, uh, use, uh, do more work with less energy or go more miles on less fuel, um, and the future for using more low carbon fuels and bio-based fuels like first and second generation renewable diesel fuels really adds to the sustainability of this technology. And you didn't ask about hybrids, but that's a kind of another factor that works in here, that diesel vehicles and engines and equipment can, and, and many are today, um, running on hybrids. And you can see that here on the streets of Washington and the Metropolitan Transit Authority and their uh, hybrid electric diesel buses. You can see it in the construction industry with uh, electric drive dozers and, and wheel loaders. You can see it in the what we think will be coming in the passenger car industry with some diesel hybrids maybe in a few years, according to the Frankfurt Auto Show um, last week. So, um, you know, those, those are the kinds of things that propel us forward. Uh, more use of biofuels, uh, a bigger focus on energy efficiency from the engine and the total vehicle, um, and uh, the, the notion that we can use more hybrids with diesel as well. 
Yes. Uh, on the subject of efficiency, I was wondering if you could talk about the prospects of uh, idle uh, reduction technologies. <laughs> the um, one of what we would consider low-hanging fruit to um, address uh, not only fuel consumption but also emissions uh, is is the reduction in what we would call discretionary idling, whether that's uh, waiting uh, in a vehicle at a loading dock situation, whether it's a tour bus operator here in the district that's trying to stay warm or cold depending on the time of year, um, uh, whether it's the long haul trucker that's you know trying to to make a living and and you know stay in his truck overnight, um, all those are opportunities to save energy. And the good news about that is that they all put money back in the pocket of the operator, which is a, a an important thing. The, the, there is technology to do that uh, within the vehicle world. We have um, auxiliary power units that are smaller diesel engines that provide just enough power to get the job done for heating, cooling, and, and things that a driver would need on a big rig. Um, we have uh, the ability to control construction equipment operation and shut down idle time through the use of remote telematics and, and GPS and cellular technology. So increasingly there are technologies being deployed to do that simple thing that you know, just turn it off if you're not using it. So um, both technologies that are smart, integrated with the vehicle, uh, things that educate, remind operators, drivers, and some of the advanced technologies to do that. And these are also very good investments um, in terms of the government helping to subsidize or offer low-interest low loans for uh, those seeking to use more of these technologies. Other questions? Uh, any questions from our folks uh, on the web, on the internet world? <laughs> Nothing yet that we've seen. Okay. Um, anything else from anyone? Richard, do you have any final thoughts, closing remarks? Okay. Well, uh, that being the case, I see that we have uh, our luncheon is available for those that, that chose to make the trek today. I'm sorry for all of you online. We we can't provide that same, <laughs> same opportunity, but... Uh, all of that food and, uh, and this message today is brought to you by, by Diesel Power, and we appreciate everyone coming. And uh, we have a substantial amount of appendices that go with this study that are available online on our website. That's www.dieselforum.org. And we'd be happy to speak with you afterwards and provide you with additional information, uh, contacts at member companies for further discussion, et cetera. So thank you all again for coming. I'd also like to say a special thanks to our uh, friends from EPA that are here in, in good number. Thank you very much, guys, for being here. We've enjoyed uh, and still enjoy working with you and, and looking forward to, uh, to the future. So thank you very much, everyone, and, and good day.